Good morning and welcome back to this series of tutorials on SimTalk. In this video, we will see one of the cornerstones of any programming language, variables. Working with variables allows us to give much more flexibility to our methods and create functionalities that would not otherwise be possible. But what exactly is a variable? Without going into technical details, we can understand a variable as a box in which we store information so we can consult it later. However, this box has a peculiarity. Once we have defined what type of information we want to save, it will not accept any other information. For example, if we create a variable to save texts, we will not be able to save numeric information afterwards, since it will only allow us to continue saving texts. Of course, we can consult or modify the information that we save in the variable as many times as we want, as long as we respect its type. And what types of variables does SimTalk allow us to use? Here we have some of the main ones, although in total there are more than 15 types available. The first two, integer and real, are both numeric types, but differ in that the real type can accept decimal values. Then we have the string type, which allows us to work with texts, which must always be written between double quotes. We can also find the Boolean type, which accepts true or false values, the object type, which stores roots to objects that exist within the model as a shortcut, and the time type, which works with time data. As you can see, they all have certain restrictions as to what information they can store and how we should write that information. All these restrictions must be respected when we write our code. If not, plant simulation will return a syntax error and will not let us execute the method. In addition to classifying variables by the type of information they store, we can also classify them by their location. Thus, we differentiate between global variables and local variables. Let's start talking about the global ones. When we talk about global variables, we are referring to variables external to the method object. That is, they do not depend on its execution. This is very useful when we want to retain that information for long periods of time or when we want to access that information from different methods. We can define variables in several ways. The first and most obvious is with the variable object found in information flow. Here we can define its name, like any other object, its data type and its value. As we see, there are more than 15 different types. We're going to call it weight, leave the type integer by default, and give it a value of 15. The initial value box allows us to define an initial value for the variable that will be reset every time we start the simulation. But an attribute of any plant simulation object can also be an external variable. Let's take, for example, a station. In addition to the attributes that come by default and that we can view by clicking the F8 key, in the last tab we have the option to define custom attributes by clicking on New. Again, it will ask us to define the name, the variable type, and the value. We are also going to name it Weight, define it as an integer, and give it a value of 15, as we did before. Once we have this information saved, we can use it in our methods. For example, we are going to instantiate a new method and print both variables through the console. We write the print command, followed by double quotes, wait, colon, an empty space. And then we close double quotes and write plus wait. If we save the changes, open the console and execute we see that it has concatenated the message that we had written in string format with the value of the variable. In this case, we are using its relative path. If we now change this value and set it to 10, for example, we can continue executing the code and the result will change. That is another advantage of using variables, making our code much more flexible and being able to make decisions based on the value that the variables have at all times, as we will see in next videos. Let's do the same exercise, but with the attribute we created before. In this case, we will change the path of the variable to that of the station.wait attribute. If we clean the console, save the changes, and execute, we can see how it also prints the value. Furthermore, the use of attributes to store information is widely used in MUs, which can transport that information as they move through our model. However, there is still one more way to save information in external variables, which is one of the most used. We are talking about tables or data tables, although in this case it has a peculiarity. In tables, each cell can be considered an external variable. But in what sense can a cell be the same as a variable object or an attribute? Let's see it with an example. 
To begin, the first thing we will do is define the type of variable we want to use. To continue with the previous examples, we will define it as integer. In the case of tables, the format of the cells cannot be defined independently, but must be done by columns. So, for example, we take the first column, we right-click here on top of the column, and select the Format option. When we do so, we find the same drop-down menu that we have seen before, where we can choose between more than 15 different types of variables. We choose Integer and save the changes. Now we can write as much integer data as we want in all the cells of the column. Let's use, for example, the first cell and write 15. The next step is to read this information from the method and print it through the console as in the previous cases. We write the print function as in the previous cases, and then we start writing the path to the table. If we leave it as is and execute, the debugger will stop at the line we just created, although this time the marker will be red. This means that there has been a runtime error or an execution error. That is, Plant Simulation has tried to execute our command and has not been able to do it. This occurs because we have not specified which cell we want to read from the table. We close the debugger, and now we're going to modify the code. To specify the cell we want to use, we write an open bracket, the column number, which in our case is the first one, a comma, the row number, which is also the first one, and close bracket. Now if we save, clean the console, and run again, we will see how the message is now written correctly. However, if we had data in several cells of the table, it can be confusing to know which cell we want to refer to. To avoid this, Plan Simulation lets us define row and column indexes. These are activated in the General Toolbar, List tab, which is only active if we have an active table. Here, in the Format section, we can activate the column indexes and the row indexes independently. This will show us the zero row and the zero column. By default, both always come in string format. Here we can give it a name to identify them. For example, we are going to define that the first column is called weight. And in the first three rows, we will put the names of three references, A, B, and C. And we will also put a weight for each one. Now, in the method we can read the same cell as before but changing the column and row numbers for their respective indexes and also for any combination of them. For example, like this. If we clean the console and run the code, we see that in all four cases we are reading the same cell. But when we work with variables, we can not only read their value, we can also modify it. To do this, we will write the path of the variable, followed by a colon and equal, and then the new value. We must ensure that this value matches the format of the variable. For example, we are going to modify the value of the second cell of the weight column, and we are going to assign it a value of 27. If we execute it, we see how we have modified the value in the table. We can also make incremental modifications, such as adding a value to the current value of the variable. Continuing with the previous example, we write the path of the variable, plus, equal, and a 3. Doing this, we add 3 to the previous value of the variable that results in 30. We can do this for numerical variables and also for subtraction and multiplication, but not for division. If we wanted to divide the previous value by another, we would have to use this syntax. This is the long version of the syntax that we have used before for addition and can also be used with the rest of the arithmetic operations, but with a hyphen in the case of subtraction or with an asterisk for multiplication. With this, we have already reviewed global variables, but if you remember from the beginning of the video, we can also use local variables. How are they different from those we have already seen? Well, the main difference is that local variables are created within the method itself and only exist while it is running. Let's also see it with an example. Let's instantiate a new method and try to do with local variables the same thing we have done so far with global variables. The first thing we need is to create or declare the variables that we want to use. To do this, we will have to follow the following syntax. We will write the word var, followed by the name we want to give to the variable, in our case, weight, a colon, and the format of the data, in our case, integer. From here, we can work with the variable in the same way as with the global ones. 
assigning it a value, for example, weight colon equal, and 59, modifying that value like writing weight asterisk equal and 2 to multiply the previous value by 2, or simply reading that value, for example, by writing print local weight, a colon and an empty space plus weight. You will have noticed that the path of this variable coincides with the relative path of the global variable that we declared before. In these cases, plan simulation will always assume that we are referring to the local variable. So, if in this case we wanted to reference the global one, we will have to use its absolute path. Let's run this method with the debugger to understand how it works. As you can see, the instruction to declare the local variable is executed automatically and jumps directly to the next line. Additionally, now in the Variables tab, our local variable appears with its current value. If you remember, at the beginning of the video, we said that zero is the default value for all types of integer variables. If we execute the following line, we will see how its value is updated. Therefore, in the Variables tab, we have a summary of all our local variables with their current values at each moment of the method execution. But we can also double-click on the value and modify it manually. If we run our code to the end, we will see that the value that has been printed out by the console is the one that we have modified by hand. This can be very useful for testing during the execution of the method when we detect an error. But the main advantage of local variables is precisely that they no longer exist when the execution of the method ends. Normally, we will use them to make intermediate calculations that make the code easier for us, but that we are not interested in saving when finished. With the latter, we have finished our review of variables, a key element for programming in any language, also in SimTalk. In the next video, we will begin to apply the concepts that we have seen during these first three tutorials in a simulation model, and we will learn to use some useful functions. Greetings, and until the next video!